Well, we are in a series titled Recenter. Have you ever gotten involved in something that just wasn't the right fit for you? So a number of years ago, I was a freshman at the Florida State University, and I was pretty psyched about being a freshman in college. And so I jumped into all kinds of things. I joined the fencing club. I joined the academic team. I joined the club volleyball team. I joined an inner tube water polo team. It's like water polo without the tiring trading of water all the time. And as some of you know, I joined the circus. Yeah, we have a circus at Florida State University. And um, a friend from high school invited me to check it out. And then he convinced me to try out the hand balancing team. Now, if you don't know what hand balancing is, I've got a picture for you this morning. Now, I am not shown in this picture because I could never do that. In fact, I have the worst possible build for a hand balancing team. Hand balancing, they're like all these guys with like builds like gymnasts. They're like five, six, and they're just jacked in their upper bodies. That is so far from me. I am 6'3". In college, I weighed 165 pounds. I had no upper body strength. I think we were the worst hand balancing team in the history of hand balancing teams. I have no idea what I was thinking. Well, our big idea in this series is that all of us get to these moments of realization in which we recognize that we've just wandered away from the center, that we're missing the life that God has for us. So all throughout this series, we want to get our lives re-centered on the person of Jesus. Now, this morning, we're going to begin by reading in Luke 21. And in Luke 21, we have Jesus anticipating the destruction of Jerusalem. Some scholars think he is even alluding to the end of the age as well, though that is debated. The primary focus is the destruction of Jerusalem. So let's begin reading in Luke 21, starting in verse 5. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord, we worship you in this place. God, you are awesome. Lord, your presence makes all things new in our lives. Lord, I pray today that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a remarkable passage at multiple levels. 
Taken at face value, Jesus is predicting one of the most defining moments in the history of Israel 40 years before it takes place. Now, because this would require supernatural insight, a number of scholars think that this material is not original to Jesus. They think that the early church made it up after these events, after 70 AD, and rewrote it into the story of Jesus. But this is highly unlikely. In fact, Jesus speaks of impending doom for Jerusalem and its temple all throughout the biblical material. For example, earlier in his gospel, Jesus says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Not only did Jesus speak on many occasions of the impending doom for Jerusalem, but oftentimes he acted it out with very significant prophetic acts. One of these occurs near the end of his life. It's recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark and also in Matthew. Here's how Mark puts it. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Jesus was hangry, I think. It's like when you're really hungry and you see a Chick-fil-A and then you think, oh, it's Sunday. Jesus is not just mad at a plant. The fig tree was a symbol for Israel. And so it wasn't so much about this plant, about what, but what God was doing in Israel. Jesus goes on. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, when Jesus says here, a den of robbers, he's actually alluding to a prophecy centuries earlier spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. And it's very interesting to read that allusion in context. Here's what we find in Jeremiah 7. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, that was a false god in the ancient Near East, and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe? safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name. This is a reference to the tabernacle, the place that Israel worshiped God before they built the temple. They set it up first in Shiloh. And see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh... I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your ancestors. I will thrust you from my presence, just as I did all your fellow Israelites, the people of Ephraim. You've made it a den of robbers. Jesus was acting out prophetically a symbol of judgment that was to come upon Israel. Now, when we read in the book of Acts, what we discover is that some of early Christians' adversaries used Jesus' predictions as accusations against them. Here's what Luke writes. Jews from the synagogue of the freedmen seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. These rumors were going about all around that place and they can be traced back to what Jesus said about Jerusalem. Now, If these things were written after the event, we might expect to read some different things in what Jesus has said in these Gospels. For example, we might expect the Gospel authors to embellish the accounts with certain details that they were aware of after the fact. For example, the temple was actually destroyed by fire. 
though none of the biblical authors refer to that. We also know there were horrific acts of cannibalism, but that's not referred to either. And on the flip side, what we do discover is that if we take Jesus' words at like a very crassly, literalistic level, then in that sense, they weren't literally fulfilled. Here's what I mean. Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, the temple was leveled. It was absolutely destroyed. But technically speaking, there were some stones that remained on top of others. In fact, you can go to Jerusalem today and see this. And some of these stones were absolutely massive. Some of them were nearly 40 feet long and weighed about 1 million pounds. Now, if it was the later church putting words in Jesus' mouth, we would not expect them to write it this way. And what is interesting is that it appears that the early church actually took heed to Jesus' warning and fled from Jerusalem when the Jewish war broke out in 66 AD. In fact, the early church historian Eusebius writes about this. Here's what he says. But the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by a revelation vouchsafed to approved men there before the war to leave the city and to dwell in a certain town of Perea called Pella. And when those that believed in Christ had come there from Jerusalem, then as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles." The most straightforward conclusion is hard to escape. Jesus predicted the downfall of Jerusalem and her temple 40 years before it took place. Now, friends, this is a powerful indication of a very important reality. Jesus is the Lord of history. Jesus is the Lord of history. Now, this is hard for many of us to believe. For many of us, it just feels almost superstitious. It's easier for us to believe that maybe everything's just random, or maybe things are controlled by some sort of vague and impersonal fate, or maybe we think that the rising and falling of societies really comes down to, as one author put it, guns, germs, and steel. Whoever can control the guns, germs, and steel will win. At a more personal level, many of us would like to think that we are in control of our own destiny, that we are in charge of our future. But what Jesus showed is that none of these things are true. The reality is that Jesus is the Lord of history. Jesus is directing history. Now, if this is the case, what in the world was going on in the first century? Why was the temple being destroyed? I mean, didn't Jesus come to save Israel? This is a very important question. And as it turns out, Jesus saw Israel very differently than the people of Israel saw themselves. The people of Israel saw their primary problem as out there. If God would just deal with these wicked Samaritans, if he would crush these oppressive Romans, then finally Israel would flourish. But Jesus saw things differently. The problem was not out there, it was at home. The people of Israel had lost sight of their identity and their calling, and because of it, they were being destroyed. Jesus told a group of disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, the people of Israel had a great calling. It began with Abraham. God said through Abraham that he would bless all nations on the earth. God told the people of Israel, you're a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Over and over again, the prophets said, the world will know who God truly is through the people of Israel. But the salt lost its saltiness, and the light got hidden underneath a bowl, and the people of Israel slipped away from the vision and the calling that God had for them. You know, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they wanted God to pour out his wrath on Rome. But what they couldn't see is that they had become Rome. They had become Rome. The leaders, the religious leaders in Israel, they loved power. They loved money. 
They loved social status. They loved their friends, and they hated their enemies. They were nationalistic. The kingdom of God was for Israel and nobody else. The temple was no longer a place of prayer for all nations. And they hated how brutal the Romans had been toward them. And they decided if Rome bears the sword against us, we will bear the sword against them. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus had to warn one of his own disciples with these words, put your sword back in its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. The apostle Paul issued a scathing rebuke to his fellow countrymen in his letter to the Romans. Here's what he writes. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. The problem was not out there. It was in here. The religious leaders wanted God to pour out his wrath on the latest iteration of Babylon. And you know what? God was doing it. But it wasn't on the Babylon they expected. It was on themselves. Now, what can we learn from all of this? When we lose sight of the identity and mission that God has for us, we will be swallowed alive. When we lose sight of the identity and mission that God has for us, we will be swallowed alive. Israel had an incredible calling to be God's holy people and to show God's glory to all the nations of the earth. God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. When God formed the people of Israel into a nation, he did this through Moses. We see this recorded in the book of Exodus. God told the people this, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel wouldn't just have priests, they would be a kingdom of priests. It would be their role to help connect the peoples of the world with the true one living God. The prophet Isaiah spoke about this. He said, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Israel had an incredible calling. She was to be God's holy people who would display God's glory so all the peoples of the earth would know who he truly is. But the vision slipped away. Israel became like the nations. They became like Rome herself. The temple became a den of robbers, and so God destroyed it. And friends, it's a reminder to us that every generation has to fight for identity and mission. Every generation has to fight for identity and mission. This is what the Apostle Paul told the church in Rome. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, what's the pattern of the world in our generation? What's the latest iteration in our culture? Well, it looks a lot like Gnosticism. Gnosticism was one of the first heresies to enter into the church, probably as early as the first century A.D. Author Mark Sayers in his book, Disappearing Church, describes early Gnosticism this way. The world of time, space, and matter in which we live is inferior 
The world is inferior because it has been created by an inferior and possibly evil God. Beyond our world and the inferior God, there is a sublime place to which we must progress. We can progress to the sublime place when we discover the divine spark within ourselves. Truth is found within the individual. We must look inside to find our true self. We can, under our own steam, progress to the sublime place through knowledge. We escape the inferior world by finding the hidden pieces of knowledge in the world and in ourselves. Well, what's the modern version look like? Well, it's not so much that the world out there, the physical world, it's inferior. We believe my world is inferior. My world is inferior. We've arrived at a very unique place in human history in which the images that we have look better than the real thing. Have you noticed this? You don't look like that picture you took of yourself on portrait mode on iPhone. Have you noticed that? Right? You look and you go, ooh, I look pretty nice right there. In fact, some of us, we would rather send pictures of ourselves to other people than actually see people in real life. Our lives are not as exciting as the lives we see on Netflix. And so we give away massive portions of our time, not living our own lives, but watching other people live their way more exciting lives. Or maybe some of us are always looking for a new city or a new job, or a new relationship, or a new experience, something to get out of this inferior life that I'm living in right now and to find a more exciting life for myself. Some of us think, if I just find that right life hack, if I just see the right YouTube video, or listen to the right podcast, or listen, or read the right uh, blog somewhere, then finally I'm going to find that key that's going to help me become a successful person that I want to be so I will no longer feel inferior, whatever the response might be. We feel like my world is inferior. Secondly, it's not that we necessarily want to escape physical existence altogether. We just want to trade in our old crummy bodies for a perfect body, right? We want a perfect body now. See, in early Gnosticism, they didn't like the physical realm at all. They wanted to escape to a spiritual reality where they could live in a spiritual bliss. That's not necessarily what we want. We just want perfect physical bodies. And so we spend gobs of money on gym memberships and cosmetics and cosmetic surgery and new diets and even kale salads, (laughs) all so that we can have a perfect body. Many of us hate ourselves because of our body. Think about that for a moment. We hate ourselves because of our bodies. We've redefined salvation. We've said salvation is a small waist, clear skin, and ripped abs. And that's what we look for in the new Gnosticism. Thirdly, we find truth by looking inward to find our authentic self. Truth is inseparable from me. Objective truth has been replaced by my truth. And you know what? Only I can decide who I am. Nobody else can tell me. My family can't tell me who I am. The church can't tell me who I am. God can't tell me who I am. I will define myself. Only I can determine who I am. Do you know this puts a massive amount of pressure on the individual soul? to have to define yourself all the time. This is one of the reasons we become so anxious and so easily depressed. We're trying to figure out who we are and define ourselves. Fourthly, the traditional God is inferior, and therefore we need to replace the traditional God with a better God. Now, here's what often happens. Remarkably, this new and better God oftentimes turns out to look a lot like ourselves. This better God is very interested in us having great abs and great apartments and great experiences and great romantic lives. And he doesn't really care so much about whom we decide to sleep with, whether we serve other people, how we live our lives and spend our money. He's not concerned about that. Our new God wants what we want. Ultimately, it's just all about me. It's all about me. It's my truth. It's my body. It's my time, it's my happiness, it's my life. For better or for worse, I am at the center of my existence. No commitment supersedes my commitment to myself. I'll fit in church when it's convenient for me. I'll fit in serving or going to a small group, loving other people when it helps me and works for me. Because ultimately, in the new Gnosticism, it's all about me. 
And here's the question each of us has to face head on. Have I traded in the identity and mission of God for the identity and mission of the world? Have I traded in the identity and mission of God for the identity and mission of the world? And you know what? Just attending church doesn't exempt us from conforming to the pattern of the world. I mean, notice this. Jesus warned that false messiahs would rise up within Israel. This is why he said to the people, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. See, invariably, these would-be messiahs would look a lot like Rome. They would use the methods of Rome to battle Rome. They were going to lead armed rebellions. In fact, this is what led to the Jewish war and ultimately the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And you know, sometimes the church becomes a lot like the world. The church starts to look a lot like the world. We're just living for the next life hack. We just want another message to make us feel good about ourselves because we're at the center of our own universe. We want something else about me. We've got to watch out. We've got to fight for the identity and mission that God has for us because, friends, it's better. It's better. The identity and mission that God has for us, it's better. What is this identity? Well, a lot could be said here. But what I want to do in just the few moments that we have, I just want to quickly survey how the Apostle Paul introduces and speaks to the churches to whom he writes. Listen to what he says. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you notice a pattern here? We're God's holy people. We're God's holy people. Now, we've got to be careful. This doesn't mean that we're prudish or arrogant or moralistic or aloof or detached. No, it just means that we live for something more than a sexy spouse or an amazing apartment or ripped abs or the body we've always wanted. God has called us for something far more profound. Holiness means being set apart for the mission and purposes of God. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it to Timothy. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Do you know every day the phone in your pocket is going to try to lure you to pursue a different identity? It wants you to pursue sexy or rock star or genius or a hundred other identities. And in fact, over and over again, you're going to see those identities applauded by the world. Friends, stand firm. Stand firm. God has called us to holiness. We are God's holy people. He has set us apart for something far more profound. Now, out of this identity flows a mission that God has for us. In fact, our mission is very similar to the mission that God originally gave to Israel. When the apostle Peter writes about this, he actually alludes to the passage in Exodus that we already read. This is what Peter writes. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Friends, we have been given a mission to make God known, to make God known in every place that we go, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our workplaces. God wants to put on display his glory, his majesty, his character. Do you know the world is desperate for God? The world is desperate for God. This is why we feel so alone and insecure, like we have no purpose. It's why we feel afraid. It's because we need God. Our hearts are desperate for him. Centuries ago, St. Augustine, at the end of the fourth century, he put it this way, you have formed us for yourself, and our hearts are restless 
till they find rest in you. Do you know God wants other people to find Jesus through you? God wants other people to meet him, to experience life and freedom through you. Now, we got to be careful because many times the temptation is to once again start imitating the world to win the world. It's almost like we think, okay, if I can just have an amazing bank account, an amazing house, an amazing job, an amazing body, amazing relationships, then finally the world will be really impressed with Jesus. Friends, we're not trying to give the world a better version of the world. Jesus has called for us to bring, him, bring them his glory and his grace. In fact, here's how the Apostle Paul calls us to the mission. What we preach is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Do you know the grace of God, the love of God, the life of God that Jesus wants to put on display through you? It's going to go way beyond your talent. It's going to go way beyond that amazing body that you have. It's going to go way beyond your cleverness. In fact, when the glory of God is on display, he's at the center. And we gladly, willingly take our jars of clay and step into the background. God has given us an identity. We're his holy people. We're his holy people. And he's given us a mission that flows out of this identity to make the glory of God known to the world. Friends, let's walk in it. Let's embrace the mission God has for us, the identity that God has for us, the temptation every day is to pursue what the world pursues. Friends, the end of that temple is destruction. But if we hold on to the identity of God and the mission of God, oh, we find real life. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship you in this place. Lord, we confess it's so easy for the identity and mission that you have for us to slip away. Lord, so many times we don't even see it happening. We just get caught up in everything that's happening around us. God, we repent. We repent, oh God. We turn from that. Lord, you told us, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God, I pray that you would meet us in this moment. Lord, you have an identity for us that you've set us apart. Lord, you've set us apart for what our heart really desires, true significance, mission that will make a difference forever. God, that's what we want. Just while we're in this moment of prayer, maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I need that identity and I want that mission. I've chased so many things in my life. I've pursued so many dead ends. My heart's so unfulfilled. I want God. I need his mission. I'm ready to follow him. I want his purpose. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you to take a very simple but concrete step, to take a moment to grab one of the cards and the seat backs in front of you and to fill it out. And on the back of that card, indicate today, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. God, we want your ways. We want your ways, oh God. Lord, I thank you that no matter where we've strayed, God, you make all things new. You recenter us. Lord, when we turn our hearts to you in a moment, God, you make all things new. And Lord, you prepare us for the destiny that you have for us, for mission. So God, we say, here we are. Lead us in your purposes. Have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give him praise today, church? We serve an awesome God.